today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, Simplifying App Migration to Kubernetes with an App-Centric Abstraction. I'm Chris Short, Principal Technical Marketing Manager at Red Hat and also Cloud Native Ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you're not able to speak as an attendee. Sorry, but you have a Q&A box. We really want you to use this Q&A box as the as a webinar is progressing, feel free to drop in questions there. Uh, we will get to as many as the end and I'll be curating them and we have another moderator on the line as well. So your questions will get answered more than likely today. So it was really cool that you're here today for this webinar. This is an official CNCF webinar. As such, it is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. Basically be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. I would be, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, I'd like to welcome our presenter today, Anoop, Director of Engineering at Highscale. Anoop, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. Uh, we're from Highscale, we've been working on solutions in the uh, container space for nearly five years now uh, from the very early days of uh, Docker and the last couple of years uh, in the Kubernetes space. Um, so my name is Anoop. Um, I take care of uh, engineering at high scale <clears throat> and uh, I have with me uh, my co-panelist Mayur Shah uh, who manages the product and I also have uh, Divya Venkatesan, who helps us with our uh, participation and interaction with the community. Um, so we're here today to share some of our experiences in migrating a particular uh, microservices-based application to Kubernetes, some of the challenges that we face, some technical insights that we thought might be interesting or useful, and also um, you know, how we went about simplifying the whole thing. All right, so the application itself was uh, an enterprise platform. Um, this platform is a low-code uh, development platform, so users would sign up uh, in order to um, build out applications in an easier way. That's what the platform let them do. Um, and, and as you can see, uh, this is a picture uh, of, of the kind of services that were there. Um, uh, and it had a service discovery, a load balancer, uh, stateful services, and so on. <clears throat> um, so, uh, so they wanted to move to Kubernetes because a lot of their customers um, were on different clouds and they wanted this platform to be set up uh, uh, you know, for them on the cloud of their choice. And so Kubernetes uh, became a natural choice for this uh, because you, know, uh, you can set up your application and, and deploy in exactly the same way um, everywhere. And uh, there were a couple of other reasons. So they would get uh, you know, user demand um, uh, with some level of volatility. So uh, sometimes you would have more users using the platform than at other times. And uh, again, uh, and, you know, it turned out to be a natural choice, uh, Kubernetes. Um, and then they also wanted to make things uh, a bit more economical. And then uh, finally, the declarative approach and the immutability of containers um, uh, were particularly attractive to make everything reliable, uh, much more than what it was before. So the pre-Kubernetes scenario looked something like this. Um, so yeah, you know, you, we had these VMs, um, and then DevOps would uh, set up the applications, uh, stack requirements, uh, uh, Java or Tomcat and other stuff like that, and configure all of that, and then also handle things like security patching to those stacks, uh, etc. Um, and uh, and then obviously the the deployment was very simple. So you would mainly uh, deploy the uh, 
the WAR file this is a Java based uh, application so it would mostly be WARs or JAR files <coughs> and that would be the deployment scenario. Um, with Kubernetes uh, this was all uh, about to change uh, it's, and it, it is obviously easier to talk about in hindsight um, but essentially um, you know all of these things uh, the stuff that DevOps uh, folks on the team did and the, the pure developers on the team did all of that had to uh, sort of get combined uh, packaged into an image and um, you know and then all of this would go through as a single uh, deployment um, into the uh, cluster uh, so this was a sort of a shift um, in the way DevOps happened, uh, in the way deployments happened. Uh, I'm just going to pause here. Uh, looks like the screen is cutting off for some folks. Um, Chris, uh, can you confirm if it's okay? It seems to be okay for me. All right. Okay. Uh, might be a temporary glitch, I guess. Then. I'll move on. All right. So with this sort of shift um, that you know that happened in the way things were deployed and delivered, um, there are some considerations uh, that we had to keep in mind. Um, you know, with the immutability of containers coming in, uh, any small change that would be needed. Um, whether it's a, you know, a change in the application or a change in its dependencies, whatever it was, it would mean that you kind of redeploy, you rebuild and redeploy. You never update anything. And this also meant that you know, uh, the frequency would kind of go up. Uh, a lot of containers uh, would live for a very short time. Um, there would be a change in how troubleshooting would happen, how debugging would happen, and again, fixes would require rebuild and redeploy and there's a sort of a role shift which uh, is indicated uh, in the previous slide as well. Um, so this entire shift uh, brought about three uh, new challenges. Uh, so the whole workflow uh, had to uh, change. Uh, there's a lot of new concepts and terminologies that uh, everybody uh, involved in the delivery would have to become familiar with. Uh, I'm sure uh, a lot of you are familiar with, with the fact that there's new stuff to be learned here. And, uh, and again, you know, troubleshooting and ops is very different, as we're going to see. So um, what we want to do here is to kind of uh, get into uh, a bit of uh, detail on the kind of things that we had to deal with um, and again, we're not wanting to present uh, sort of best practices or anything like that in a very comprehensive manner that's available to us. But what we wanted to talk about is the, the journey that we went through and uh, some of the learnings we got through that journey. And hopefully that's uh, useful, um, uh, at least uh, to some of you who would want to migrate your applications to Kubernetes. So for the next 10 minutes, uh, you know, I'm going to get into each of these aspects and what we did there. Uh, and then after that, uh, I'm going to uh, zoom out and come back to a bird's eye view and talk about how we eased things. So I'll start with service discovery. So um, a lot of the applications uh, the microservices based applications in particular or even other applications might be dependent on service discovery mechanisms from the past um, and uh, some of those mechanisms may not work very well or even if they do work uh, we'll see why it might make sense to move to Kubernetes native discovery uh, how we went about trying to do that without making changes to the code first and then and then later did that. So we're going to talk about uh, the points you see here. Um, so a quick recap, uh, uh, you know, a lot of you would be familiar with this. So um, we, uh, so in this particular application, they were using console um, 
And uh, so we had services that wanted to talk to other services, so just a re recap of uh, basic service discovery, right? So uh, platform service would uh, come up, for example, uh, this is pre-Kubernetes, and uh, basically there would be a sort of a post hook which would register its IP into console, and then when some other service, like a studio service, for example, uh, which is the name of another service there, um, would simply query console for the platform IP and then talk to the platform. Um, so there were several reasons to want to move towards Kubernetes, Kubernetes uh, native discovery. Um, uh, one uh, obvious uh, point would be that we wouldn't need to maintain or run console anymore. Um, Kubernetes itself would do the job. Uh, and then registration is automatic. So here we would need to write some post hooks and uh, do stuff like that. But in Kubernetes, you don't need to do the registration. Um, and then, uh, you know, because this works well with Kubernetes uh, DNS, so uh, if you query for a service name in Kubernetes, once you deployed your service, you, then you would be able to get back the service IP by simply making a DNS call, uh, just like that, right, without any extra um, effort or extra code or scripts on your part. And uh, finally, uh, you know, if you have a lot of replicas um, for your service, I assume uh, most of you would be familiar with pods and replicas, uh, then, you know, if your service has many pods as replicas, then, then Kubernetes uh, service discovery will return you a service IP, uh, which is a single IP, and then behind the scenes when you hit the service IP, it would automatically round robin the traffic um, to all of the pods behind, to the different pod IPs, uh, which is again, uh, very useful. Um, so, so how did we go about that, right? So that's, that's uh, you know, plain Kubernetes stuff, but uh, so initially uh, from console, we wanted to not change everything at, at one shot. So we had like, uh, in this application, there were 15 or so microservices and all of those had the console library as part of the code, which would, so the code would talk to console through that library and all of that. Uh, so we would have to go in and, and rip out that code from all the 15 services. We did, so the, the idea was they didn't want to do that until they were sure that Kubernetes would work. Uh, so initially we simply uh, modified the entries that went into console so that console, uh, so the code would continue to query console and console would return just the Kubernetes service name instead of an IP. And then from that point, uh, the, the service would, would talk or make HTTP calls using the Kubernetes service name, which would simply resolve through the Kubernetes DNS. Uh, obviously, this is not a great idea to go to production, right? So um, this is still the journey. Uh, so you'd have two hops to get to the service, uh, but it allowed um, the application to get onto Kubernetes very quickly and you know people could parallelly deal with other challenges while this one was still being fixed. So from there we came to the second attempt which was to avoid the two hops uh, and then since by that point um, we had shown that it would work reasonably well so uh, we got rid of console completely and then uh, simply depended on Kubernetes DNS to get the service IP. Uh, there are some interesting uh, caveats here uh, to know when you do this. Um, so one interesting thing is that when you, when you try to resolve the service name in Kubernetes, you will get a service IP even if the pods, uh, you know, there's not even a single pod that's, um, that's healthy. Uh, so you'll still get the service IP. So you wouldn't know uh, until you make the request to that service. And um, then there were issues we faced with connection pooling. Um, I'm not sure if that is resolved or can be because um, you get a service IP if you have multiple replicas behind. And so you don't get to the actual pod IPs, right? The service IP is like a proxy to the pods behind. And so you can't really set up a connection pool, which is very useful if you're if you want to do that for a database use case. Um, and again, you're limited to, uh, you know, the round robining of the traffic to the pods behind. 
So then we did a different thing uh, so that we could only get to the healthy parts. Uh, so what we did then was to change things around. So instead of depending on the Kubernetes DNS to get the service IP, we would query Kubernetes API uh, to get the, the pod IPs. So if you had three pod, three pod replicas for your service, it would return the, the pod IPs and we would then have to cache those IPs and, and periodically invalidate and refresh the cache, et cetera. But now we could then, be, you know, Kubernetes would return the, only those which were healthy, um, and we could do things like uh, pooling, et cetera. Um, there's pros and cons to both doing the second way here and the third way here. For a lot of simple services, you simply might want to rely on the Kubernetes DNS itself. But if you have an advanced use case, then, then you might want to go and get the pod IPs. Um, so uh, after this whole migration was done, in, in recent times, in recent months, uh, there have been some other options uh, that have come up um, and, and we've come across. Uh, you might want to use uh, something like the ribbon library if you're using Spring, or there could be similar libraries in um, other languages, which will help you to query the Kubernetes API for pod IPs in your code. Um, and then uh, console and, and even others like maybe Eureka, et cetera, um, service discovery mechanisms, they have now uh, libraries or ways to sync, to set up a sync between, say, console and Kubernetes service discovery. Uh, we haven't really used this uh, in, in production uh, or anything like that, and you know we're not sure if what, what kind of out of sync issues you might get with broken networks, et cetera. That is something you might want to uh, check. But uh, these options exist. All right. So I'm going to move to the second thing, um, and of course uh, the, the six things that we're going to talk about here are not comprehensive, right? There's a lot more things that you would need to do to migrate your application, but uh, you know, uh, these were kind of important or uh, insightful things for us, and so we thought to cover these. So in this one, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, what we did and what we tried to do for uh, volumes um, and, and, and handling data, et cetera. Um, so again, a quick recap. Uh, you know, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. Um, with these concepts, uh, so there's uh, persistent volumes, uh, PVs in short, right? And uh, for example, uh, this represents, uh, I mean, it's in very rough terms, I can say this represents a physical volume. Uh, so for example, it would represent an EBS volume if you're using EBS as your storage. Um, uh, and then there's, there's PVCs or uh, persistent volume claims where you kind of specify uh, which pod uh, this particular PV needs to get attached into. Um, and then whenever you need to do persistent volumes, you will deploy your services as a stateful set. Um, so typically, the services you deploy into Kubernetes, you know, there's two primary ways to deploy them. Uh, one is you might want to deploy them as a deployment, as what is called a deployment, right? Or, or what is called a stateful set. Uh, but in this case, uh, with PVs, you want to do stateful set because then the stateful set will ensure that whenever the pod is scheduled or rescheduled, uh, the volume attachments are properly maintained. Um, and so that's a quick recap. All right, so uh, some of the things we've, uh, we, you know, we did in the course of the migration. Um, so if, you know, wherever we had some EBS volumes uh, or, you know, either with data or, um, you know, we brought back a volume from a snapshot or something like that, or we had a, in, uh, yeah, at that point we didn't have, we didn't have snapshot. Uh, um, the snapshot support in Kubernetes was still alpha. Um, I think it's still beta right now. So we, we would create a volume from the snapshot and then create a, a PV to sort of um, uh, represent that volume and then do all of these things that I talked about. So this was a, uh, how we kind of brought back data that was existing elsewhere in a, in, you know, in a volume or in a, um, in a snapshot. Um, 
uh, as of today, I believe you can also specify your snapshot IDs directly here uh, in, in your PVs or PVCs and let Kubernetes handle it. That is now supported by several providers, but again, it's a beta feature you might want to use with caution. Um, uh, then there's uh, dynamic provisioning, uh, which, which basically means instead of creating a, a you know, persistent volume, let's say you don't have existing data, you're doing a fresh deployment. So we had a few cases where we were deploying services afresh, like for example, services that might need to store some data, uh, persist data temporarily until that data was shipped away to some other place. In those cases, it would start blank. In, and in those services, we would simply create a persistent volume claim and let the claim automatically manage the life cycle of the required volume. So it would automatically bring up physical volumes when this was deployed. And that, uh, you know, that was helpful for some of these um, other cases where the, uh, the data had to be temporarily persisted. Um, and then there's uh, the third case, which was a uh, stateful set with a claim uh, template um, so uh, if you need to sort of uh, have a case where you are going to uh, create replicas of your service, so once again, uh, we did this for some cases where we wanted to use uh, like say logs and stuff um, or some kind of uh, debug data which we wanted to, which would then get shipped off um, periodically. Uh, and if we wanted to scale that service, then that service we would create with what is called a claim template inside a stateful set. And so this makes sure that whenever a new replica part is created, then uh, you know, a, a, a persistent volume is automatically uh, attached to that new replica. Um, it also makes things easier because you just handle the stateful set YAML. Um, but that's, uh, anyway, that's where we use this uh, kind of a thing. So some of the considerations, uh, so we would, uh, you know, sometimes get breakages here um, uh, because as you can see, there's a lot of referencing that needs to be proper and you don't want to take a chance with your um, data volumes and stuff. Uh, so you need to make sure that you refer the right things in the right uh, YAMLs or YAML sections, uh, I guess. Um, then uh, if you're doing volume resizing and uh, you know we, we were using claim templates and we ran into this problem at some point where we wanted to resize, it is not possible to submit a resize patch to the claim template. Um, so if you're using a claim template, uh, then uh, it, you know, it, that would error out. So you would want to query the claim template to figure out what claim uh, got created for you by this claim template and then apply a resize onto it. So yeah, uh, a bit of a technicality, but that was again something that uh, tripped us up and uh, we had to do that. Finally, um, there's multi-zone challenges that, that were faced. So for example, um, so if you're running in two different availability zones and um, let's, say, let's say the pod died and the pod got rescheduled to the second zone, um, then you, you know, but your volume is stuck in the first zone. Um, so now, um, after uh, at some point after we did this migration, so I think um, we have uh, topology aware uh, provisioning in Kubernetes. Um, last I checked, that was still beta and uh, supported on the major public cloud providers. So. Uh, this might not be a problem anymore, but if you're running uh, some kind of a zone setup in your data center, then you will likely face this problem. So what we did to solve this was um, we don't want this pod X to come back in a different zone when it dies. So when the pod dies, Kubernetes will try to reschedule that pod automatically, right? So we, we don't want it to come back in a different zone. So you would want to use um, labels for your zones and set up what is called node affinity, right? And then set up the node affinity for your pods uh, so that the pod would always get rescheduled onto the same uh, zone where you have your volume. So uh, we sold it with node affinity. All right, so moving on. So 
you know, we, we had our own load balancer, and in Kubernetes, there's a sort of a native way to do that. How do we configure it? And what sort of abstraction does Kubernetes provide? Uh, let's talk a little bit about that. So, um, so in the pre-Kubernetes scenario, we had um, console and, uh, uh, you know, and, and then we would have some uh, code which would watch console and register all the nodes into the load balancer. In Kubernetes, um, you will use something like an ingress controller, right? So, um, uh, so the ingress controller would sort of control the whole, the, the way it would work. And then you have ingresses, uh, which is basically a set of rules and these rules specify what context path sh uh, should go to which service. So if you get traffic for a specific context path like slash login, then it should go to the login service. Um, so this sort of here is in plain English, but obviously you would need to write the YAML for it. Um, so you would want to do this, and then you will create an ingress and deploy that ingress into Kubernetes. And then your ingress controller is watching for new ingresses that you submit, and then those particular um, rules would then get activated. So again, this is you know Kubernetes stuff. A uh, couple of things that we did. Um, so initially, we aggregated all of our context paths pointing to different services in a single ingress. So you can have multiple rules, multiple rules, and so we would we created a single ingress and then the ingress controller would pick up that ingress and apply all the rules, which basically meant all the context paths. Uh, one of the problems with that is that um, you, can, you, know, the, the, you can only set a single set of timeouts or, or things like headers and so on for all of it. So uh, things like uh, you know, headers or timeouts would be set at the controller level per ingress. So, if you have all the all the rules or all the context paths in a single ingress, then all of them would get the same uh, configurations of uh, you know size limits or timeouts and stuff. So what you want to be able to do is uh, then you actually want to create a different ingress itself for each of your services. Um, so that was one interesting thing we went through. Um, and then uh, the other thing is uh, you would want to do SSL configuration for, for some of the ingress or some of the hosts uh, that you have. And um, that you would need to create a, a Kubernetes secret, which is the secret store in Kubernetes, uh, right? And, and then you would uh, push your certificate chains and stuff like that into the secret and then refer that uh, inside your ingress rules. So, you know, that, again, we spent a fair bit of time trying to get that right. Some more considerations about ingress. Um, so the context path routing and uh, a couple of things around it, like uh, setting up different host names uh, for a route, etc. So a few of those context path related things are abstracted, but uh, a lot of other configurations are provider specific. So uh, one thing I, uh, I missed to mention um, which was on the earlier slide, was that um, ingress controllers are, uh, they're not native in the sense that um, ingress controllers, you have different types of ingress controllers. So you've got different providers. For example, you have an in Nginx ingress controller or a traffic ingress controller and so on, right? And so whatever configuration goes into the ingress controller, is sort of provider specific. So like, for example, if you use an Nginx ingress controller, then you would need to use config maps and ingress annotations to configure it. If you used a, maybe a traffic ingress controller, uh, you might use service annotations uh, to configure it. So, so things like that. So every ingress controller type has provider specific configurations and it's, uh, that's, uh, I guess it, it, it's just the way it is, and it's probably evolving, um, and, and that's something we have to deal with. And again, uh, another thing was that the regex that is supported that you put into an ingress is a little different from the one that is directly supported by uh, some of the providers like Nginx, et cetera. Um, 
And um, one thing to, to definitely, definitely do is you want to set your ingress controller to watch out for ingresses only within relevant namespaces. So let's say you've got a staging namespace and a production namespace, uh, and you have a, an ingress controller that you want to restrict to watch staging namespace for ingresses. Uh, you don't want a production ingress to be grabbed by that uh, staging ingress controller. So um, uh, that, that's, uh, that's one thing to do. I guess that's one, also one way of using namespaces in Kubernetes is to do different environments uh, in, in each namespace. That's uh, how we did it. Um, moving on, so you've got uh, configuration properties, right, and, and templates. So there's config maps in Kubernetes. Uh, how did we do configuration earlier? So you would have application code, which would get deployed along with the configuration, uh, either a file or sometimes an environment property, and the application would read it from there. In Kubernetes, uh, so basically the application is uh, getting packaged into your container and the props are going separately into the config store in Kubernetes. Um, and then you can configure that to get injected as an environment variable or uh, get mounted as a file uh, in, in, inside your pod, right? And, and so that the application can then continue to read it the way it used to read it uh, before. Uh, some things to be uh, aware of. So since you're going to be deploying these properties or changing the values in your config map independent, potentially independent of your uh, uh, image changes, uh, you would want to make sure that you revise those config maps uh, in some way. You maintain revisions by yourself somewhere, um, either use Git with some tagging or some other mechanism to know when what value was deployed so that if you ever want to roll back some of those configuration value changes, you'll be able to do that. Another important thing is, so if you're using environment variables for properties and you change a value in a config map, then those changes won't reflect until you restart your pod. Um, that problem won't exist if you're using it as a file. So those are two uh, important things. Um, now you have different configurations for different environments. So I have staging, I have production, et cetera. Um, and uh, Helm charts, uh, as many of you would be familiar, provide a way to um, to sort of have uh, different configuration properties without having to, you know, write a different set of YAMLs itself for every environment, which you don't want to do, right? So you create a single set of YAMLs for your service and, you know, sort of with like placeholders. And then um, uh, Helm uses Go templating. So in order to understand a Helm chart, you need to understand the YAMLs and uh, Go templating. Uh, one of the things uh, with Helm is um, sometimes debugging can be hard because you don't know if the problem is in the Helm chart or, you know, uh, uh, or in the application or the configuration that, that you've written, right? And the Helm chart author is somebody else. And if it's third party, it's all the more um, challenging unless you understand the chart well. Um, the other thing we found with Helm charts is that it, it provides a very nice way to group all the YAMLs of a particular service or an application. So for example, uh, for a given service, you might write six or seven uh, different YAML files, and that sort of gets grouped uh, nicely uh, with a Helm chart. But once you deploy this, then that grouping is lost and you know, sort of becomes like just scattered and independent resources inside Kubernetes. Uh, we found the charts to be useful for a lot of off-the-shelf services and less for the kind of custom services that we um, had in that particular application. Uh, all right, so the, the fifth thing I want to cover is the manifests themselves, the YAML files. Um, very important to know what goes into the Docker file and what goes into the YAML. So for example, you might have ports in your Docker file, but it, you know that's not going to make any difference um, that won't get honored unless you put the ports in your Kubernetes uh, YAML. Uh, so things like that, so you need to know what goes where. Um, especially if you're coming from the container world, then um, that becomes important. It's also important to know what type of Kubernetes uh, configurations go into which kind of Kubernetes resources. So what, what kind of things can you put inside a stateful set versus a deployment versus a, a, a replica set versus a job and so on. So 
that's important. And then um, everything, everything that you would ever deploy, whether it's a property, a configuration, a, you know, some sort of a definition, whatever it is, uh, all of it is now YAML. So it's very important to understand uh, Kubernetes terminologies and concepts, which can get quite daunting very quickly. Um, and then also you need to bind those things together. So you've got all these six, seven YAMLs and different resources uh, configured inside them, and you would use labels to sort of uh, bind all those different things together uh, to work correctly for a given service. Um, <clears throat> all right, so some challenges with troubleshooting. So uh, typically, in order to get logs, so you would go figure out your uh, deployment, get the pods of that deployment, then get the containers in the pod, and then go get the logs of each of those containers uh, and do that for all the replicas that you have. Um, so it's something get, that gets really tedious and, and uh, difficult at some point. So you definitely want to consider log aggregation. You would you know, want to use sidecar agents uh, to collect the logs and, and send it off somewhere. Um, it's a very important thing. We, we struggled initially with this and then immediately went into uh, log aggregation with sidecars. Uh, sometimes there's uh, you know, sort of a temptation to get into the pod. So it's sort of like doing an SSH into the pod. Um, maybe, maybe if you want to check the process tree that's running inside, et cetera. Uh, but this is something you want to do very cautiously because you don't want to uh, inadvertently change something. Uh, then you would lose immutability. Um, and, and that will cause a lot of, uh, yeah, a, a lot of headache. Um, so, yeah, uh, you know, this was one place where we started to consider uh, observability tools and debugging agents and so on. Um, it's something hard to get away from, and I guess uh, also cultural. Um, and finally, the other challenge with troubleshooting was uh, the kind of error messages that you get can be quite cryptic. Uh, th these are definitely messages that typically uh, DevOps uh, skilled person or a, develop, uh, a typical application developer would not understand, right? So, um, you know, what do you do with errors like that and what does it mean? How do you then debug it, et cetera? So those were uh, some of the challenges we faced. So I'm gonna take a step back and come back to a bird's eye view. Um, so with all of those kind of things that we dealt with to do the migration, what did we find was that there are a lot of complexities that we would require many people in the team to understand. And that um, definitely is time consuming. There's a lot of repetitive effort because um, we had to create a lot of different YAMLs, uh, four different services, um, uh, and, and again, you know, do that for um, other applications too. Subsequently, we started to migrate other applications and, and you know, we found uh, similar challenges in the first couple of migrations. Um, there's some uh, friction because, you know, everybody's working off the same set of YAMLs. Um, there's some inputs coming in from developers, some inputs from DevOps. Um, and as we saw at the very beginning, there's sort of like a process overlap that has happened. And then um, the debugging challenges would cause uh, sort of delivery cycles to slow down. Um, we thought to find some solutions towards all of this uh, to make the migrations easier. Um, so one of the things we did was to create an abstraction over Kubernetes so that, uh, you know, uh, developers or application teams could simply specify the needs of their service in terminologies that they already understand and wouldn't have to learn something new. Um, and then automatically generate all the YAML files and the Docker files needed. This would provide a, a standard way of doing things and different teams, different service teams wouldn't go away and uh, start reinventing the wheel in different ways. And it would provide a, I mean, the goal was to provide a self-service way for um, the teams to quickly deliver or deploy. Um, so what is the abstraction that we created? So, uh, you know, there's terminologies that application teams would intuitively understand, right? Um, so people would be familiar with what is a volume or a health check or a port and things like that. Um, and, but uh, in Kubernetes, there's a whole lot of uh, things to know. Uh, obviously, 
you know, your service or application may not need all of these things, but it's important to figure out which of these things you should know and how those different things fit together. Um, and hence, we felt the need for abstracting a lot of this stuff. Uh, how do we do that? So we started to create uh, app-centric keywords. Uh, I'll show you some examples in the next slide um, that are very easy for teams to just put in or intuitive to understand when you read them. And then, you know, then start writing a tool that would then infer what needs to be done. So for example, if you specify that your service needs a data path, right, a particular a path to where, where it stores data to be persisted, then we would infer, the tool would then look at that and infer that it needs to generate a stateful set YAML, a, a, a PVC template, and so on and so forth, right? And, uh, and then so all of these things would be translated into Kubernetes speak, which means translated into all, all the relevant kinds and resources, bind them all correctly using the right labels, and then also uh, try and provide a way to troubleshoot in, in uh, plain English, I guess. So this is the kind of abstraction that we uh, started to build um, from whatever we learned through that migration and also other migrations. Um, so these are some sample snippets of what we called uh, head spec. Uh, we made the schema for the spec, head spec available on GitHub, um, and you can check it out. So if you want a volume for your service, you pretty much just, just say that, something like that, and then, then essentially let it create all the persistent volume claims and staple sets and so on. Uh, let's say you want to set up uh, auto-scaling for your service. So you would just say, I need one min, one ma four max, or whatever. So something like this would generate the required kind of YAMLs. And similarly for, for things like health check, which would generate a liveness check or readiness check and so on and so forth. So stuff like that. Uh, you can check out more on the spec. And so once you've got the spec, essentially you prepare a complete spec of all the things that your service needs, uh, which typically tends to be about 15, 20 lines uh, for most services, uh, sometimes a little bit more, and then you, you know, you invoke the tool. So we created a tool which would read the spec and do the right inference, generate the Docker file if necessary, generate the Kubernetes file manifest, and then talk to um, the Kubernetes API and deploy. And essentially, you will get back a URL. Um, so a few months ago, we decided to uh, make this available to the community, and so we made that open source, and it's available, again, at that GitHub URL that you see on the screen right now. Um, so, so yeah, that's how we did the deployment, and uh, essentially, uh, we've started, you know, uh, building out the abstraction for troubleshooting. So if you get, if Kubernetes, uh, you know, returns an error message like crash loopback, then, uh, you know, we try to run through a flow chart inside the tool automatically, and that would check various things, and then it would try and tell you where the problem might be. So it might tell you, hey, there's problems in the start commands, like your CMD or other stuff. And, or it'll tell you, hey, some of your health check is failing, or it's an incorrect health check, and so on. So we try to translate it and abstract out the, the complex or cryptic messages as much as possible. So we made a start towards this, and this should be out in a day or two. We have, uh, um, you know, some of this coming out. Um, so yeah, I think through this whole talk, um, you know, we focused mostly on the automation and the abstraction required, um, which, which is where a lot of the, you know, because that's where you talk to Kubernetes and there's a lot of complexity. Uh, but obviously to complete the migration, we also built a, sort of a, you know, a layer um, uh, other than this, right, or on top of this uh, automation, which would do things like integrate with your CI or Jenkins and then do container image scanning, other DevSecOps stuff, uh, do change tracking and all of that. But again, those are things you would do um, anyhow and not very Kubernetes specific. So mostly we've covered this, but just for sake of completeness, we also, I just wanted to mention, we also built um, a sort of a, the whole CI CD and, and the pipeline stuff separately um, for the sake of that migration. Um, so some of 
our observations, uh, uh, especially after we employed some of the solutions that we built, um, uh, you know, and some of the abstractions, et cetera. Uh, so there are some some things which we were kind of able to measure, like you know, to be safe on some of the effort or some of the, you know, like we saved a lot of, like it's, it's hard to measure, but a lot of lines of YAMLs, for example, and um, definitely upgrade times went down between the VM world and the Kubernetes world. Um, so there were some things which we could kind of measure, and then there were some soft findings, like for example. Um, you know, the, the learning curve uh, went really low. So we would be able to bring somebody new onto the team and they would be able to very easily deal with deployments uh, in a very short span of time, uh, things like that. So that's pretty much, uh, pretty much it about um, our experience. Um, we would like to invite you to try uh, high scale. If you like what you see, uh, please star us on GitHub and you can reach out to us at any time um, for any sort of queries or even ideas. Um, Twitter uh, is cool, or if you would want to do email, um, there's the email ID. Um, at this point, uh, I would like to invite uh, you all to take a, a short poll of a couple of new questions, just three questions. Um, it would take a minute or so. This will help us understand better the needs of the community um, and continue to build out uh, the tool and evolve the head spec. Uh, so please do take a minute or two to do the poll, and um, yeah, and then we can we can do some Q and A if there are any questions. Sure. Thank you very much for the uh, wonderful presentation today. So. <clears throat> Uh, there is a question in the Q&A, but I think it's like a broader question that we could probably both help answer to an extent. Uh, question is, with pod process namespace sharing, that's new in Kate's uh, 1.17, is it possible to decouple tightly coupled legacy apps, communicate through IPC, named pipe, shared memory, so forth, and migrate as separate containers within a pod. So do you want to take a stab at that or do you uh, want to talk about this together? <laughs> uh, yeah, that's so it's more of a sort of a Kubernetes question, I guess. Right. right? Um, so yeah, Tamil, yeah. this is this is a very like Kubernetes specific question, but uh, I can help you with it a little bit. I don't uh, running multiple containers in the same pod is fine, uh -huh. right? Like you can do that natively right out of the box now. Um, that's basically what sidecars are. They're just another container in the same pod sharing that same environment. Um, <clears throat> how you communicate within that pod is entirely up to you at that point, right? Like you've got the pod network there. Everything's self-contained in that pod. So however you want to communicate is fine. I'm not sure the question about namespace sharing and memory sharing, right? Like I'm not, I'm not sure where that comes in. Um, but uh, feel free to contact me afterwards. Uh, Chris Short on Twitter, uh, Chris at ChrisShort.net is my email. And we can talk about that further if you want. Um, another question come in from a tool, uh, assuming that you will be able to ingest existing YAML files and create HSpec for use with high scale question mark. What about pure Docker swarm deployments? Would you be able to convert to Kate's environment constructs? Thanks. Yeah. Um, so how would so, you take somebody uh, from yeah. Docker swarm over to high scale basically is the question. Yeah, uh, and, and also about the ingestion. So uh, at this point in time, so we, so since we started to build this abstraction mainly to help with uh, you know, to help with um, moving workloads into Kubernetes. So, you know, it started off with the assumption that there is no Kubernetes YAMLs existing, right? Um, because that's that's how it evolved. Uh, but this is something that, that has come up before to us and, you know, we're certainly uh, going to consider it. If, if, you, if you guys think that, you know, it will be cool to take your existing YAMLs and then provide a head spec automatically that can be built. Um, and, and that, that's, you know, that's great feedback. Um, we don't have that right now. 
but we can then make it possible for you to just simply use the head spec and then continue deployments with the head spec and let it manage the YAMLs and the life cycle of whatever YAML changes need to happen. Um, and uh, about Docker Swarm, yeah, so again, there's no conversion back, right, uh, either for the Kubernetes YAMLs or for Docker Swarm. But it's fairly simpler to come come away from Docker Swarm because a lot of the, the sort of the constructs of the directives uh, you would be uh, intuitively familiar with. Uh, so it's not a huge amount of effort uh, to do that change. Um, I'd be happy to talk a little more um, on that. Uh, feel free to reach out um, on the email ID that, that's there. Yeah, and going going from Docker Swarm YAMLs to uh, Kubernetes YAML is possible. There's tools for that out there. I've used them. Uh, but if your Swarm right. configuration is very, very like, uh, you know, long or excess, you know, like very has a lot of configuration options that are very Docker specific, there might be you might have to do your own mucking around. But there's a way to go from Swarm to Kates, but then ingesting from Kates into high scale like that is the interesting point. Yeah, that, that's pretty interesting. I mean, this has come up only once or twice, uh, but it has come up before. Um, but we would definitely love to see if you know folks would uh, want to use high scale and head spec. Um, you know, even though they're already in Kubernetes, because you know it, it maybe it simplifies uh, further deployments or further changes to your application. Then uh, it would make sense to ingest those uh, Kates, YAMLs, and uh, give you back the um, head spec. So we'll certainly consider that. Awesome. Um, there was a question about the license. I went ahead and looked that up and put that in the chat and the Q&A. It's Apache 2 licensed for everybody that didn't see it in text. Um, and I think that covers it. Uh, any other questions from the audience before we log off here? Feel free to drop them in chat, Q&A box, whatever works for you. Oh. Anonymous attendee, what is the roadmap for high scale? Yeah, so uh, there, there are some um, things around uh, creating additional specs uh, for things like jobs, for example, uh, is something that we've been asked. And again, we're trying to, we're, we're fair, fairly new in, in, in the uh, community. Like I said, it's just a couple of months now and, you know, in between we had all the holidays in December. Uh, so we'd certainly like to hear more from you guys. Please feel free to put some issues on GitHub, and we will also um, make some efforts to put up the roadmap on GitHub soon so that you can see what's coming up. Um, and uh, yeah, the other thing we want to strengthen is the troubleshooting stuff, right? So definitely want to strengthen troubleshooting. We find that incredibly useful, um, and we hope that you guys will too. I know, uh if I just may add here a little bit on the roadmap, uh, you guys can hear me, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so basically, um, you know, in this journey of uh, automating and making simply uh, the whole journey to Kubernetes simpler, what we are doing with Highscale is um, we started with the most popular workloads. Uh, so basically, our traditional web workloads um, and uh, custom application workloads. Uh, we've now taken this journey to also other kinds of workloads. So now we are looking at data workloads. We are looking at new form of um, serverless and other kind of workloads. So not so there's uh, rapid, um, so we are increasing in the types of workloads that uh, Highscale can um, automate. Uh, additionally, as Kubernetes is progressing in its uh, journey, uh, we are uh, almost uh, in sort of line in, in line with Kubernetes. So we make a um, lot of uh, improvements in Highscale with uh, the learnings that we have from Kubernetes. Um, and uh, there's two versions of high skills. So there's the open source version and there's an enterprise version. So for folks who also want to, um, are looking at a more high, like um, large scale deployments, uh, there are a lot of capabilities in the enterprise version that we are adding around monitoring, around troubleshooting, around um, just the overall um, operational uh, simplicity of a Kubernetes uh, deployment. So all of that is getting, uh, uh, is, is part of the roadmap. Awesome. All right, uh, we're running out of time very quickly here, but we have two more questions. What does the typical migration process involve and what kind of timelines are you looking at? Yeah, I guess that really depends. Um, 
on, on the application itself. So usually what we do is that at the beginning of the migration, we do an assessment of the application itself uh, even before we start. So, you know, what kind of an application do you have? Uh, is it microservices? Uh, you know, does it have legacy components? Uh, what kind of staple um, services does it include? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And then you know, typically one of the things that invariably comes up is you know, hey, is this uh, good for Kubernetes? Right? Uh, should we do Kubernetes at all for this kind of an application? Um, so that assessment usually helps us decide the time. Uh, there are some really small things that some teams have done, like, you know, hey, I have these three services and can I just migrate it? So that's, you know, in, in, in roughly a, a week to two weeks, they've got um, these services running inside Kubernetes because of, you know, hey, I just write a head spec and deploy. So that's very simple. But if, if you have a large application which is in production, large number of users, it will go through a much, much bigger cycle. and. The, the first, the big one that I talked about uh, in, in the beginning of the um, presentation today, that took us uh, uh, several months, um, several months to do that migration, just to sort of give you an idea. Um, can iScale be integrated with any Kubernetes monitoring tools? Yeah, great question. So, yeah, we do abstract out sidecars. So you can attach a an agent, a monitoring agent or a logging agent um, in a very simple way using the abstraction we have. Um, that's, uh, you can go check that out also on our GitHub page. Uh, we also have a nice tutorial on highscale.io, um, which will help you. And so if you, if you wanna do monitoring using agents or sidecars, then yeah. Um, otherwise, if you're doing it separately, like using, let's say, a daemon set in your node, then it's, um, that's separate from application deployment. Um, so that's how you would do it. And, and one interesting point here is, if you're doing sidecars through high scale, then, um, so right now we're just deploying those as simple containers inside the pod, right? But uh, with 1.18, we're definitely gonna take advantage of the sidecar kind, and we hope that comes out. It's supposed to come out in 17. Uh, but uh, once that's out, then high scale will automatically generate a sidecar kind. Um, so you get a, like this kind of an advantage of, like you can automatically take advantage of new Kubernetes features in that way. Um, so yeah, that, that's, uh, that's pretty much on the monitoring side. Okay, well, uh, Chris had a drop. Sorry about that. He had a conflicting meeting. Um, so I'm going to close this up. Uh, thanks, Anu, for a great presentation. Um, uh, thanks for, for everyone joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate you coming along with us for this uh, webinar. The recording and slides will be online later today at the CNCF webinar page. And we're looking forward to seeing you at a future CNCF. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks Have a good day. Bye. <laughs>